Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, I wanted to go through a, um, a, a little bit more granular, uh, fine-grained example associated with uh, particle filtering, both as a case study that is, uh, is thought-provoking, uh, as well as a um, reference to another published paper. Uh, this is amongst those that I have included in the background information for this boot camp. Um, as well as to uh, illustrate possible uh, meshing between uh, communication behavior data from online, on the one hand, and, uh, uh, and particle filtering. Uh, and finally, to give some additional concrete understanding of, um, of how particle filtering works. Um, so uh, I pulled together um, some added slides beyond uh, what I had previously presented uh, on this topic and other events that I hope will be uh, useful. And I'll be posting the updated slides later. So this work uh, relates to a paper. Um, it's actually related to two papers. Um, Firstly, um, uh, available uh, some years back now, I'd say it's maybe five years back, six years back, maybe even a bit longer, a very interesting paper came out on, um, uh, on the subject of the linkage between um, uh, contagions of pathogen on the one hand and anxiety or fear on the other. Uh, in the context of uh, influenza. Uh, this was work that um, uh, was, uh, was made current by the H1N1 epidemic, uh, the pandemic, uh, but it also uh, sought to explain patterns that were seen historically in the 1918 flu pandemic uh, that caused millions of deaths worldwide um, across many continents. Um, and it was entitled The Couple Contagion Dynamics of Fear and Disease, uh, Mathematical and Computational Explorations, and included amongst its several contributors um, two prominent agent based modelers in the health sphere in the States, Ross Hammond and Josh Epstein, uh, who at the time I believe was at uh, Hopkins. Um, and uh, this model basically portrayed two contagion processes um, that were operating simultaneously in, in an entangled fashion, in a fashion that um, uh, depended each upon the other. So um, we had susceptible individuals, and these susceptible individuals could, in a traditional flu fashion, become exposed to disease, infected, but not yet infective, become infective, infectious, they could spread the infection, and then recover. Um, but beyond that, they could further develop anxiety or fear, or they become afraid. Um, we can, I'm going to use those terms, uh, although they have different uh, specific clinical meanings or, or connotations. I'm going to use them more or less synonymously for the sake of this talk. They could become afraid, and becoming afraid, they could sequester themselves or remove themselves from contact. This was a notable phenomenon in 1918 flu, where people sought to hide out during the flu transmission. But it was also a, a, an effect that, um, in the form of social distancing, plausibly took place in significant amounts within the 2009-2010 um, uh, flu pandemic, uh, H4H1N1 flu. Now, those individuals who are moved due to fear would uh, remain uninfected because of their sequester, uh, sequestration, and we could then emerge back to a, an unprotected susceptible state. Um, alternatively, individuals could become infective um, while at the same time um, uh, fear, fearful um, of the consequences uh, and uh, develop that. Um, uh, that fear and infectivity largely simultaneously, um, and having done so, they might uh, sequester themselves um, due to this, but some might recover uh, before uh, becoming uh, removed as well. And then there's some dynamics involving this, uh, this removal in terms of uh, 
they're infected, they, they could go to an infected state or could simply recover. So um, this was a model that was laid out and argued for its relevance in the pages of this uh, PLOS One paper um, by these uh, notable authors. We're going to be discussing the system in the context of particle filtering um, and informing it with empirical evidence. And to that end, I'm just going to indicate for each of these stocks a short symbolic name that I don't expect you to remember, but rather so that you could refer back to the slide and use it as a Rosetta Stone if you see I sub FP, what is that referring to? To what does that refer? Okay. So the idea is that each of these stocks will have a short symbolic name that will be associated with equations here that basically characterize, well, characterize this system at a mathematical level and involve classic kind of mixing terms associated with, um, uh, associated with uh, mass action, uh, transfer of infection, transmission of infection, et cetera. Now, um, for the sake of particle filtering, we were interested in trying to use data from the 2009-2010 to flu pandemic from two jurisdictions separately um, to test generalizability to estimate uh, the state of the system to, uh, to try to help us probe how many people, for example, at any one time were fearful or removed due to fear, the degree to which, by extension, we might be able to argue that this removal might have affected dynamics, et cetera. Um, so within the context uh, of this model, we incorporated each of these uh, state variables into our particle filtering uh, state factor. Um, so each particle, um, as we've covered in our previous lectures on particle filtering theory, each, um, uh, each particle will have a complete representation of the state of the model. It has a complete hypothesis about what's currently going on in the world in terms of a particular value for the susceptible, for the for the counter, for susceptible, counter afraid, counter exposed, counter infective, et cetera. Each particle is gonna have a, a complete hypothesis Hypothesis have some viewpoint on at a given point in time how many people are in each of these states and each particle will evolve according to these equations. But beyond that, we also supplemented per those examples yesterday, those uh, variables with some what might be called uh, dynamic parameters. Okay? These are parameters which varied over time according to random walks, so though often in a log transform fashion. Um, and uh, very importantly, they included uh, contacts per day, um, and the log of that was taken, so reflecting the fact that C is between zero and infinity, and if you do a random walk on that, you start having to do a special casing. If it goes to zero, it can't go any lower, um, and it can never get below zero in the first place. And it, it's kind of a pain. Um, so we log transformed it, which turns it from something from zero to infinity um, for C itself to log of C being from minus infinity to plus infinity. Um, the closer it becomes zero, the, the more the log will be more and more negative. Um, and then we add uh, additionally um, some factors like you've seen yesterday for reporting fraction. And here we consider a fraction of incidents incident cases of pathogen infection that are reported, uh, that have reached the infective stage that are reported, and, and then fraction of fear cases that lead to Google search. You're probably seeing where this will go. The people searching online, okay? Um, and uh, we have some additional ones as well that relate uh, different uh, terms, including, say, a removal rate from an afraid to a self-isolated uh, state, which was less definite. So in terms of particle filtering, we were trying to probe using particle filtering, uh, informed by data over time, how many people were in each of these stocks, and the, um, to, to, to arrive at a distribution over the value of these dynamic parameters as well. 
as a consequence, um, for the particle filtering involved, we had uh, state barrier, state vectors associated with each particle. Each particle had a view of the world, a hypothesis about what's going on in the, in the world that included all the states of that model um, and values for each of these dynamic parameters. So at a given point in time, a particle would have a certain value that it believes it, it operates in the world, a certain number of susceptibles, a certain number of exposed, a certain number of those infected by pathogen alone, those infected by fear or anxiety or, or um, who are afraid alone, those infected by both, etc. And that particle would believe at this time exactly that is the case in the world. And another particle would have a, a very different thought, perhaps, about what's going on in the world. And particles will evolve according to model equations and random walks for these lower variables um, uh, according to, uh, to model dynamics, such as that is shown here. Okay? Sorry. Yeah? Just from that vectors that you showed yeah. in the slide. Yeah. So from here, can we say that when we calculate the likelihood functions yes. that will base on the stocks? I'll be talking a lot about that. Um, but. Broadly, the likelihood functions um, will depend on model state. So, so we'll be turning to likelihood functions. The likelihood function would say for a given particle that posits a certain situation in the world, state of the world, what is the likelihood of observing a certain empirical datum, a certain observation from the world, right? And here we're actually consider two types of datums one drawn from Google search and one drawn from clinical or lab confirmed cases, okay? Now, um, that likelihood function, yes, it will reflect model state. So this model state will imply something, and this is, this is important in terms of conceptual understanding about the practicalities of applying. Given a certain model state, remember my introduction to system dynamics a couple days back, I said, in system dynamics, the stocks determine the flows. So, you know, if there's zero people susceptible, you're not going to have anyone going from susceptible to exposed. The state determines flows. If you have a billion people are susceptible, you're going to have often more people getting exposed, you know, going from susceptible to exposed. The value of a flow in general for a system dynamics model depends on the state of the model. So like this flow, outflow from S to exposed depends on the number of people asked, right? Um, and it's very common within uh, this sphere in, in health, um, uh, and I would argue probably common in, in a number of different applications of particle filtering, for when we're trying to make sense of empirical data, if we try to find where, what does that data correspond to in the world? This is a key need with particle filtering that I want to emphasize with this talk, so it's not a distraction. If I data from the world, say the number of people presenting for illness, right? Because of illness, uh, presenting because they're, they're feeling sick, right? Um, that would relate to something about this model. And there are times where it relates directly to a stop, directly to a stop. But often it relates to a flow, okay? So if we consider the number of people who are presenting for care, those are people who are just getting infected, probably. They, you know, you could argue, well, maybe it's people who have been infected, but it's kind of like the way I, I view it, each new person as they become infected they're going to then or within a short time decide, do I go in for care? Do I go seek out an emergency room or a primary care physician consultation? And so we treated, when we consider new cases of infection, we want to compare that, what we see in the world, to what we expect from the model. Well, typically, often that relates not directly to a stock immediately, but to a flow. It's proportional to a flow. Now, Flows are, proportion, are, are related to stocks, they're determined by stocks. So ultimately, it's given by the stocks, but it's often most directly related to the flow. So this is true in Cheyenne's model, too. Um, uh, by contrast, in Young's model, 
the number of mosquitoes related to the number of uh, adult mosquitoes. It wasn't like each mosquito on reaching its 18th day birthday, it decided whether or not it will get trapped, right? It isn't like that at all. It's the, the, the probability of mosquito will, uh, the, the number of mosquitoes you catch in a trap depends on the number of the mosquitoes around. So they're dependent on a stock. In Shayan's model, also, she was keeping track of new cases of infection. And so it depended on a flow, and actually, well, an integral of a flow. Um, but that's, uh, that's another matter. So here, the observations about number of presenting cases will relate to basically these flows here, the flows into infective, uh, from exposed to infective and from susceptible to afraid infective and from afraid to afraid infective. These three, um, these three flows collectively um, tell you how quickly people are getting infected in the model and by implications how many of them are getting infected per week or per day. And we actually have daily data. So if you consider this flow from exposed to infective as a per day flow, it says six people per day are becoming infective, and six, you know, via this flow, and five per day from susceptible to afraid infective, and another, you know, five from afraid to afraid infective. Um, five plus five plus six, or 16 people in total becoming infective, and then there's going to be a reporting rate that each of them has a probability being reported. Okay. So it's a very common need with particle filter models that I want to talk about here, so I'm glad we're doing it, that you have data from the world and you say, what does this relate to in the model? What is its analog in the model? Because you have to find an analog to it to compare it to the model. Hmm? This is a common model I need. I mean, it, it's, not, it's not privileged to particle filtering, but it comes up a lot in particle filtering because we're comparing with external data by definition with particle filter. So here, our empirical data will relate to those flows. It will also, will have other flows um, that it turns out will be relevant for Google search, and I'll talk about that. Yes, so Lavi. The empirical data we have are actually like the number related to, like directly is the number of susceptible or exposed or infected. No, no, the but empirical data here. Well. Like, I mean, when we collect data, we collect data as like, okay, so uncertainty. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry, I thought of the number of, uh, like, how many people are susceptible and things like we, that. We don't have data. Generally, it's hard. So there are cases yeah. in the world, um, in, in epidemiology, in public health, where you might have access to some estimate of the number of susceptible people or the number of recovered people. You know, like if you have a seroprevalence study or something like that, you might arrive at some estimates. But generally speaking, if we have data from, from uh, you know, that, those are expensive to do. We can go around and test people's latent, for latent TB infection. But most of the data we have um, day to day is often things like care presentation numbers. So how many presented at the emergency room with a lab confirmed case of H1N1 influenza? And so there's a flow. It's like people flowing into the emergency room. We're not keeping track of like the stock of people who are currently infected with with influenza and you know counting them out, you know, reducing that as they get recovered or something. No, we're dealing with new cases that are presented for care. So it's related to a flow. Okay? Okay. So um, it got us a little bit ahead of ourselves with this presentation, but I wanted to go there anyway, so it's, it's a good question. So we, we sought to ask a set of questions here, and one of them, the one that motivates this, this presentation, so sorry, this turns out really bad in this projector, despite the lower quality, so we wanted to consider, look, if we supplemented data from presentation count, if we, if we have data from presentation counts, could we particle filter a model like this to figure out, um, to project forward, to estimate model state, and to ask what if questions effectively? But if we further had access to data that related to anxiety or fear, things like people searching online about influenza and its symptoms, et cetera, 
it relates to um, concerns about influenza. Um, and we were to supplement really high quality, say clinical or lab confirmed case data with search query volume data or Twitter volume data, um, uh, could it aid prediction of outbreak evolution? Um, this, was the, this was the idea, and it may seem strange, and it, uh, I wouldn't mind if it seemed strange to you, this idea of, wait a minute, I mean, we have this gold uh, in the form of lab-confirmed cases. How could it be that we want to pollute it or contaminate it with, with a comparatively lower quality data, such as from search data online, where we don't really know the context why they're searching, if it's the same person searching more than once, there's all sorts of, you know, uh, all sorts of um, noise and confusion as to, to, to the degree to which that's really going to be um, informative here. Why would we want to supplement higher quality data with this low quality data? Take our gold and combine it with the dross of lead, you know, associated with search data. And, and this was the provocative question, could we improve our particle filter okay. um, here because of this, by supplementing a new data source rather than just relying on a more traditional one. So this is influenza searches in Canada over time. Um, this is on a monthly basis. And we're focused on this period here, which is 2009 to 2010, um, which exhibited two waves of, um, of influenza. One in late 2009, one in, in 2010, as I recall. Um, okay, um, so I noted uh, in response to Lavi's question that um, with respect to uh, data from um, incident case counts, um, uh, lab confirmed or clinically confirmed, um, we sought to analogize it to certain flows here from the original model. Um, uh, by contrast, for search data, we sought to say, well, the analog in the model would be when people are becoming afraid. Just as, as incident case counts reflect um, probably a certain fraction of the people who have recently or are now becoming infected, those that go in for care. So it is that searching, we thought um, plausibly there might be search behavior undertaken by those becoming afraid um, and seeking to find out more information. And those becoming afraid within the model, we, we uh, pointed this flow and this flow. We recognize that there are limitations here, and we certainly recognize that just as not everyone who got infected will be reported, most of the people who were doing, um, or becoming afraid are not gonna engage in searching online or tweeting about it. But we thought that um, there might be uh, some fraction that were or tweeting about it. And that relates to this parameter earlier, fraction of fear, of new fear cases that, that engage in Google search behavior. So what data did we have through for, for um, grounding this model? Well, one thing is that we had um, cases from two different jurisdictions, or sorry, we had data from two different jurisdictions, each having a pair of data types. The first data type was more traditional data. This was uh, reported cases, hospital admissions, and ICU admissions from Manitoba um, on a daily basis. Okay. So we have daily data on clinical presentations that were diagnosed as H1N1. We further had data on actually multiple, from multiple sources, including um, uh, uh, phone calls, I believe this was, uh, clinic calls, as well as Google search data. Um, we, in this particular application, we only made use of Google search data. And there's an interesting question, if we also brought this call data in, could we approve it? And the answer almost certainly would be yes, in, in a substantial way. But that's outside the scope of this kind of more tutorial form of this. Um, so we have data on multiple keywords, searching people for searching, say, for H1N1 or for influenza or for flu. Um, and, um, and we formed a time series of this that was also daily in its, um, in its understanding, okay? Or maybe this was weekly, I just have to double check that um, from memory, I, I don't recall. It's, uh, in any case, it's in the paper. Um, 
Now from Quebec, um, we had uh, a premier vague and a deuxième vague, so there was a first and second wave. Um, and uh, we had um, a number of, I believe this was clinical cases um, uh, diagnosed. It may have been lab confirmed cases. And again, my memory is, is off, but I could certainly find out for you uh, immediately by referring over here to, uh, to our paper, okay? Um, okay, so, um, so we had uh, clinical data. We also had uh, calls data and emergency department uh, presentation data. Um, we further had multilingual search data from Quebec. Um, which related to uh, flu, okay? Um, and uh, we made use of that. This is daily data, as you can see. And it's noisy, and it's messy, and it is incomplete, and it is, uh, uh, includes a lot of noise in the sense of many irrelevant searches. I'm sure people may have been searching for a school report, or they may have been searching you know, um, because they got a flu a long time ago, or they may have been searching because they heard a news story. Well, okay, um, but they might be anxious as another reason. So I want to talk about bringing these data together with the underlying model dynamics, okay? Simple model, published model that we're adapting, um, supplemented by some dynamic parameters, and then we have these two data sources from each of two jurisdictions, Quebec and Manitoba. Um, how do we bring the data together with the models? Well, in my earlier tutorials that provided on particle filtering to you, I noted that a key component of it is the likelihood function, right? Um, we had talked earlier uh, about uh, the basics of the particle filtering algorithm. Um, and uh, here we had talked about the, the, the basic um, operation of the particle filtering, the role of resampling, um, but I had noted um, that, at an, that while the model runs, the particle filtering model runs each particle independently and according to standard rules, according to standard model dynamics between observations, at observation, so what's called the update phase, that's when the action takes place in terms of, of um, calling that model to account in terms of the observed data, okay? And we argued that within particle filtering, you don't update a model's expectation of the underlying state. It has, as of the time of the observation, a certain understanding about what's going on in the world. And it has a certain belief about how many people are susceptible, the number of people that are currently afraid only, the number of people who are afraid and infected, the number of people who are purely infected, et cetera, right? We talked about this earlier. Each particle has a certain view of the world. It thinks this is the case in the, mo in the world right now. And another particle may think something else is the case, right? Each of those particles is called to an accounting when it comes to um, the observed data. So this particle thinks a certain thing is the case. And what we're going to do is compute the likelihood that that particle, given that particle's view of the world, its, its state vector, would exp the likelihood that given that, it would explain the empirical observation vector. So given the state of the particle, particular particle, we compute the likelihood that it will it will observe the empirical observation vector. Okay, um, here it's an observation vector con consists of two types of observations for for some of the runs, namely clinical or lab confirmed cases on the one hand, and um, and uh, uh, searches uh, searches online, count of searches online for that day on the other. So this likelihood plays a big role, right? We're going to multiply the existing particle weight, which is a reflection of kind of the level of representation of that particle in the distribution. You could think of it as reflecting the credibility of that particle, the degree of credence the model of the particle filter places in that particle. That weight already exists. 
reflective of how well that particle matched pro uh, previous data. And we're going to multiply that weight by the likelihood, update that weight by multiplied by the likelihood. And we're going to arrive at a new weight, right? That, that new weight will be normalized. And that new weight will be larger if that particle is consistent with this new observation. It will be smaller if the particle is quite inconsistent, expectations are inconsistent with the observation. And and therefore, we will reward particles that by giving them a higher weight if they are consistent and, and demote particles if they are inconsistent. And as we noted earlier, there's a survival of the fittest where they actually die out in resampling. But we won't get into that right now. The resampling will sort through and let low weighted particles uh, die out. So remember how that worked, right? Each particle here is going to have a state like this. And this state, as I just said to Lavi, this state will imply values for the flows, because the flows are totally determined by the state and the parameter. So, so it's going to imply certain values that the model, the particle express, expects for, for uh, the number of people growing infective. And, and, the part, and each particle is further associated here with a fraction of incidence cases that are reported, F sub P. And if you multiply those together, the total number that are becoming infected, that's this flow from exposed to infective plus this flows from susceptible to afraid effective and this flow from afraid to afraid effective. If you total those up, that flow per day, so maybe at 16 people, like I said earlier, you know, in the course of the day, and suppose we have a, a, a dynamic parameter associated with that, uh, that particular particle of F sub F, right? Um, uh, that's 0.5. So half, it posits that half of the people with infection get reported. Then it would be 16 times 0.5 or 8 people they would expect to be reported, right? So we're going to be evaluating a likelihood function that compares the model's expectation of the number of getting infected, um, which is going to be dependent on the model. This says, says model stage should be to state for that particle, right? Um, and we're going to ask what's the probability or probability density we'd observe the number of cases, no, the, the observed data given this, this particle state, right? Does that make sense? So the particle posits this rate of reporting, this many people getting infected, et cetera, and we're going to say, well, if you think that's the case, right, um, what's the probability that you would think, with that view of the world, that you would that you would observe this many empirical cases of new infection and, for some of our runs, searches. Right? We calculate that that likelihood. That gives us the likelihood. Okay. And this says model state again to be pedantic about it or to be specific. Um, particle state. Right. Particle state, let's make it green. What do you think? Particle state, okay? This is like the Christmas slide. It's red and green, right? Um, um, even I sometimes see colors. Um, okay, and this likelihood function, we haven't really talked about that much, and, and it's a big practical thing, so I want to talk about it a bit here. There are many con uh, distributions that we've used across different models. Binomial distribution, negative, negative binomial. It's not negative distribution. Sorry, folks, um, but uh, this this needs to be corrected. Uh, negative binomial, or it's also called the. It, it's it's basically interchangeable with just a reparameterization of Pascal distribution, Poisson distribution. We saw that in Young's model where she was computing. Uh, the rate at which mosquitoes get caught, um, normal distribution, log normal. These are different distributions we've used. We've assumed that errors are you know, binomially distributed or Poisson distributed, normally, um, log normally, um, uh, you know, for, for different models. So we're going to have a likelihood function that's going to be in a certain distributional form. Okay? Um, and 
When we first started doing particle platoon, we would often use binomial. And it makes a lot of sense, right? Um, you think, look, there's 16 people who are getting infected. And each one of them has a certain probability, let's say 0.5, right, of being reported. And so you might reasonably say, well, wait, this sounds a lot like binomial, right? Because we have 16 flips of a coin. Each one has a probability 0.5 of getting heads. And so the number of people actually being reported would be binomially distributed, right? It could be excused for saying that. And that's not an unreasonable way to approach it. And, and we did that early on, but we started to encounter some, some difficulties. And, um, and, one, and the difficulties that we encountered is that there's a, as I characterize it, a stiff upper bound in, in the reporting count, okay? Um, so, so bear me out on this. Um, uh, so suppose you have 16 flips of the coin. Each flip is whether a certain new patient gets reported. A certain new, a, a certain new person who's dealing sick with if H1 influenza gets reported. Um, there's some possibility that you might have zero cases reported, right? You can flip tails every time, right? There's some possibility one person might be reported, right? Two, two persons. On average, it'd be about eight people, right? Flip that coin. And, and you flip it on average, it'd be eight. The peak will be at eight, but there'll be some chance it'll be more than eight, right? A chance. Um, 10 people, yeah. Could be lucky with those heads today. Um, uh, could be seven, right? Any number. But, but there's a value that's actually quite impossible. And that's any value above 16, right? It's going to tell you the probability of seeing a value above 16 reported is zero. Zero. Um, and when we ran with binomial, um, uh, what we'd often encounter is a situation where, you know, we knew that there are people being reported who are probably not, in fact, not, do not have in fact uh, H1N1, particularly if it's clinical diagnosis that's based on symptoms. You might be confused with, amongst other things, with seasonal influenza. And, um, and yet we would have, be ending up with zero probability that someone, that, that you'd have more than, you know, a given particle which posited 16 people actually getting infected would say 17, you're reporting 17 cases, that's impossible, it's zero probability. And we thought that that was too, um, too harsh a judgment because there's, there certainly are cases reported that are not H1N1 influenza. Secondly, you'd sometimes get situations where all the particles had, um, were, ha, uh, had a number of cases uh, getting infected in the model that were below the actual number that were reported. And all of the particles would therefore have a likelihood of zero. All would be updated to zero weight. And when we tried to normalize, it would be zero divided by zero, and bad things would happen, and, and, and so on. And so at a practical level, we talked with Dr. Liu, and we went back to a distribution that actually had been used in related contexts by past contributions um, uh, for MCMC, as it turns out, which is a negative binomial distribution. Now it turns out that gives, this gives you a lot of the flavor of what you want, but in a way that doesn't have this stiff upper bound. It allows more cases than you expect. It's just, it's a, it's a tail that, that, that uh, travels off. So we assumed here that um, the distribution of, of reporting, given the number that are actually infected in the model, I sub t follows a negative binomial distribution, um, which uh, is centered at I sub t, but has a dispersion parameter r, okay? So many of you may not be as familiar with the negative binomial distribution as the positive binomial, but it can be written um, in this form, okay? And I know this is a bit, bit busy, but I thought I'd color it to sort of highlight the basic structure. So we have some number of observed cases, y sub t, from the empirical data. Let's, for, although this will come up again with search counts, let's just uh, say this is clinical cases confirmed. We have a certain number of underlying cases in the model. 
And we want to understand the likelihood of observing this many of observed cases given this number of underlying cases. Right? It turns out that a negative binomial characterization um, we can write in the, the following fashion. Um, this is, you know, this, choose this. It's a combinatorial uh, expression and um, comes from combinatorics. Uh, P here is a probability uh, and it's based on the ratio of I sub T over I sub T plus R. This is just how this is defined. So um, uh, it's, it's not something we had to make choice about. It's, it's defined by the negative binomial distribution. And, um, and uh, this is the form, and then we have this R, which is the dispersion parameter. It appears in these two, two places, okay? Um, actually, four places. Should be a little pointer to that, right? Um, so it appears in, in four different places within this, um, within this uh, formula. But this is a standard formula that's computed for us. We don't have to compute it. We just called the appropriate, uh, appropriate um, statistical uh, uh, function for the uh, probability distribution involved. So this is negative binomial, and this is what it looks like. With the dispersion, so this dispersion parameter will, as you change it, the mean stays the same. The mean is going to stay at I sub, um, well, it's actually here going to be I sub t times. So I sub t is the expected number. So it's going to be the, the incident rate um, in the model times the reporting rate. That's uh, this, this guy here, I sub t. And no, if you change R, it's not going to change the mean value you expect, but it's going to change the dispersion around it, the sort of how spread out it was. So let's, let's see this. Dispersion parameter of one, it looks like this. There's a negative binomial. Uh, for, for the sake of just illustrating it, mu here, the, the mean is 1,000. So the mean of this is 1,000. And it goes out here to the right, but um, uh, it's sort of truncated just for visual uh, display here. The mean here is 1,000. Does this look familiar to you? Does this remind you of another type of distribution? It begins with G. And it's related to one that begins with E. That's the continuous analog. It's a geometric distribution. Okay. With R equals 1, it's, um, that's a size in R, in, in the statistical package R. This is how you denote R, the parameter, the dispersion parameter. So this is with R equal 1. Watch this. The, I'm going to show you a bunch of these where the mean is going to stay the same. The only thing that's going to change is the dispersion parameter. Okay, ready? That's R equals 1. Here's R equals 2. You'll notice the mean is roughly... No, it is exactly the same, I'll tell you that. But you notice that this has a, center t a central tendency now that's quite clear. There's a peak here. This is R equal 4. I'm successively doubling R. 1, 2, 4. And now you start to see something that looks, well, it looks vaguely, it's skewed, and, uh, but it's you know, sort of skewed bell shape. It looks a little bit like a, I don't know, log normal or, or a beta distribution or something. Um, the mean is 1,000, the R is 4. And you'll notice it's becoming tighter, right? L look at this scale, 0 to 3,000. Um, 0 to 3,000 here, it's becoming a little, there's less of it way out here to the right. Here's 0 to 3,000, there's less of it out here to the right. It's becoming more concentrated around the 1,000. Do you see that? Watch this, R equal 8. Look, at, there's very little out here, right? It's becoming highly concentrated. Let's try R equals 16. Okay, very, you know, here's 3,000, right? It's very little out there. It's concentrated, 32, okay? And I'll tell you that ours were between 16 and 32. So it's quite concentrated. This is the likely function. This is asking, ask, asking us how accommodating are we with the likelihood? You know, if we think we should have 1,000 cases, and we, based on the reporting rate times the number of underlying people getting sick in the model, how harshly do we judge something that's off, let's say, at uh, 1,500 um, versus you know, something that's uh, 2,000, right? And this is going to say, well, well, 1,500 is low likelihood, but 2,000 is infinitesimal, right? Whereas if we went back to, to a um, dispersion parameter here, of one, let's say, if we had 
1,500 versus 2,000. The difference between those would be quite uh, quite modest. Yes, Levy. So, sorry, so how harshly we judge the number is based on the dispersion uh, per uh, uh, How harshly we judge uh, deviation. To what degree we demand something that's really much closer to any plausible pl uh, um, probability of occurrence. And are we between? Correct. We're going to choose the dispersion parameter okay. that will help us best. Okay, and actually, it was chosen heuristically. We these days we probably do a calibration on it. Um, this was actually chosen by kind of trying it out and finding ones which seem to work best. It bears a lot on how effective particle filtering is going to be at at taking new data and narrowing down the distribution based on it. If it if it has a dispersion parameter that's very small. That's extremely common. Say anything goes. Yeah, I, you know, I think there should be a thousand cases, two thousand, no problem, right? Um, it's not going to, if it's not going to judge two thousand harshly, then it will allow a very broad likelihood function and things, particles that are, or sorry, um, it will allow particles to be quite far off from the empirical data without much, much problem. Okay, so it'll allow a very broad set of particles. By contrast, if, if this is a quite a narrow function, it's going to be fairly harsh in dropping off particles that are quite far from the empirical data, as it turns out. Okay? So it, it, it really gets into how, how, um, how, how much credence, to a degree, it gives in the in believing the new empirical datum. So if you think your empirical datum is very noisy, you give it a broader, um, a broader R because you think, hey, you know, I don't really, I don't really give much credence to this new observation. I think it's a shooting from the hip observation. It's rough and ready. I'm not going to be judging particles that are really quite far off from it too harshly. We'll, we'll ding them a bit if they're off from it, but we won't you know, come down on them really hard. But meanwhile, if you, if you go up to something like this, 128, I mean, take a look at this. You know, if something's off at 1,500, it's going to be multiplied by a likelihood function that is like way low. You know, it's going to be multiplied. Its weight is going to be updated in something that's like 0. 0.00001 or something like that. And its weight is going to plummet. And so its representation in the distribution is going to take a, a real hit. It's going to be it's going to be really penalized for missing this, right? Missing the boat. But meanwhile, if we had a very low dispersion parameter, um, you know, it would be um, uh, it, it would be more accommodating. It wouldn't you know hard, judge it too harshly, and it would allow for a wider distribution. So at, in the posterior distribution, the width of the posterior is significantly influenced by this dispersion parameter. A high dispersion parameter will lead to a low, lower width associated with the, uh, uh, the uh, posterior distribution after an observation because a really high dispersion parameter may lead to particles to be chopped off in a harsh way. Yeah? And this is because we know that we're dealing with negative binomial distributions, so we're choosing the, the dispersions per meter. If our distribution is a different type of distribution, we're not choosing the dispersions there, there are, right? Well, it's a good question. The, the, the truth is that many but not all distributions have parameters that are analogous in the sense that they relate to the dispersion. Uh, there are just as many distributions as measures of central tendency. Uh, many, many distributions will have measures of sort of dispersion. You know, for example, right, uh, normal or log normal, they have the sigma parameter. They'll, they'll, you know, it tells you how wide it is for the same mean, right? Um, so very practical question. These are exactly the sort of questions I'm trying to stir up by this example. The examples presented yesterday were really good to give you a, a big picture of what's possible and you know, really impressive in terms of what they can achieve, but they didn't have the time to go into the details. And this is a decidedly simplistic one. No, it's published, you know, and, and actually I'm, I'm pretty happy with the eye-opening nature of the results. It's actually not that impressive a particle filtering model. It's more thought-provoking in terms of the results you'll be seeing. 
But it's a very good example for talking about the details of particle filtering. Like the, the day-to-day choices we make when, when choosing our likelihood distribution. And you know, the type of the likelihood, right? Poisson or whatever. By the way, Poisson is one that doesn't have a dispersion parameter. All you have is a lambda. You're only dealt with a lambda. That's all you got to deal with is a lambda. Um, but log normal, normal, et cetera, you, you can have you can have dispersion components, right, for a lot of parameters. Um, okay, so for clinical likelihood, we chose 40. This is what it looks like with r equal 40, the dispersion parameter. So we have two likelihood functions. And uh, this, again, it's a practical question that behind the scenes, um, you know, a magician like Stella Yen, who's able to do such amazing things, she has a bag of tricks, right? She has um, uh, a set of things in her bag that she tries out. And one of them is this trick that we're using here. When we have multivariate likelihood, when we have a likelihood that depends on two types of observables, um, one type that's number of cases reported, uh, a, a pathogen, right, a number of infections reported, and the other is number of searches conducted. You know, it would be nice to have a multivariate likelihood, but in order to achieve it, we did the kind of obvious thing, we multiplied two likelihoods. One for clinical and one by search data, because we didn't have a really good theory about how one related to the other, and we, we just multiplied them, okay? And, and we've done that more than once. Um, Xiaoyan's models have have examples of this and many of our other models that, you know, we, it's, and I don't, I'm no longer embarrassed by it. I think it's, it's, it's a fine start. And if anyone wants to suggest a multivariate formulation for us that's better, I will be glad to consider it. In some cases, you know, a multiplication of two normals is a multivariate normal. So in some cases, it's the same thing mathematically. Um, but just as a note, so we're going to have a clinical likelihood function. And this was the dispersion parameter we used for that, r equals 40. And for search likelihood, it was broader. It was broader because we thought the data was less, less tight. Okay, so now let's talk about these likelihoods. So we have these negative binomial likelihoods. Both were negative binomials. The idea is there was some number of people who could have searched, and each person had a certain probability of search. There were a certain number of people who could have presented for care, and each probability, each person had a certain probability of presenting for care. That was the idea. Right? Um, and so we had a likelihood of infection with pathogen, a likelihood of infection for peer, uh, for, with, with fear, and this is just the form of the negative bundle. Did we write this out? Did we do the calculation using these? No, we called off to to the appropriate uh, statistical functions that calculate a negative binomial. But this is what goes on behind the scenes in terms of how it uses the R's. And the R's are different. One is 25, one is 40, so it just told you. Okay, um, and obviously the Y's are different. This is going to be the Y, Y sub PT is the, y, is the observations of people presenting for care. Y sub FT is the number of observations of people who are searching. Um, searching online. Okay, so so I, I think you folks have a have a gut feel for this by now. But you know, imagine we have many particles. And I've listed here P1, P2, and P3. And um, each particle, to just try to drive this point brutally home, each particle is associated with a state factor. Right? That's that state factor that I covered earlier. Right? So remember, remember this uh, when I introduced the model structure. And I'm sorry, but uh, remember I introduced the model structure. I said each of these is an element of the state vector. Each of these um, these variables, right? And then we had some additional uh, dynamic parameters. Those form the state vector. So every particle at a given time has some particular belief about each of these elements of the state vector, right? And that's what we see here in this, uh, in this here diagram that I was showing you. So this particle thinks there's 902 susceptible people. There's 31 people exposed. There's 42 people who are purely infected with influenza. 
There's 220 people, I think it's who are, um, well, here, you just look up here. So this is 220, it's the fourth one down. Those infected by fear. And these are, you know, dynamic parameters down there, um, colored in, in blue, right? But they're all just elements of the state factor. So this particle's belief about the world, the current state of the world at a certain time. So, you know, we'll say without, I just, I picked these numbers very quickly. This is nothing too deep about their formulation for, you know, time t, right? Um, it's just an example time, right? Um, so each particle has a certain belief about the world as specified in the state factor, a certain belief about how many people are in each stock and the values of the dynamic parameters. And then we have, for this time t, we have some um, implied for each particle, some number of people that they're expecting to present for care. Right? Based on this fraction of those sick who, uh, in, in, uh, who, who, uh, who present for care times the, the flows associated with um, uh, people getting infected, the total number of people getting newly infected, which is implied, which you can just calculate directly based on these states of the model in the top part, right? Because um, the flows depend totally on the stock. One of the reasons in the first day I made that point, you know, so particularly stocks determine flows. So given this state up here, you can calculate what the flows would be for particle one and multiply it times this F sub P, uh, this guy here, to get the number of people it expects to get infected, right? Um, uh, oh, you'd also, and yes, and, and calculate the values of the flows would require C here, the contact rate 0.02, et cetera. So in short, I, I hope you can get a sense, you can believe me, that these values here, expected case count, can be calculated for each particle separately from the state of that particle. The state of the particle plus the equations behind the model um, and any fixed parameters that we're not changing completely imply like expected case count is 12 for P1 or expected case count is 15 for P2 or expected case count is 2 for P3. In other words, um, uh, given the information in the particle, given the things that are not changing between particles that are fixed for the entire model, like parameter values, and given the equations for the model, these, these things just immediately can be calculated. Okay? This expected case number. Same thing with expected number of searches. Given the state vector for a model, given the equations of the model, given the, the parameters which obtain across the entire model, we have we can calculate the expected number of searches for the model. This is, this is like model expected number, okay? So this is, uh, forgive me, I just want this, I'm trying to make this, um, I recognize maybe not everyone has followed all parts of what I've talked about before, so I just want to make this um, as, as, as uh, clear as I can. Um, so these are model expected case counts for this particle, or particle, how's, how's that? Um, uh, particle expected case counts based on the model, right? Particle um, expected case counts. So based on the model equations, these values and any fixed parameters, you can calculate these for part. It's a mechanical thing. You just plug it in, these numbers into the formula and any other parameter values and, and you get out 12 or you get out 20. You're, you, you, do you see that? Do you believe that? Do you believe that? So, so in other words, Given, given those model equations, I can calculate each of these, okay? Um, this does not involve any sort of likelihood yet. This is just how many people are getting sick of the model, according to the equations, times the fraction of them that are reported, F sub P, you know, which is given for each particle, right? So for this particle, these state variables at the top imply how many people are getting infected, you know, per day. And we multiply that, so that's implied by the top part of each particle, whatever it is, and then we multiply it times uh, the second value down, 0.1 for the first particle. Um, you know, we give uh, 12 or whatever. Okay? Can you believe that? Are you, are you comfortable with that? Any questions about that? Because this is what's implied by the model for each part by the particle. The particle state implies these values for the expectation. Yes. 
No, yet. there's no stochastics. No stochastics in this picture. Okay. There's stochastics that have governed these formulas as they've evolved in the past. But the, like in this picture, there's no stochastics. Zero. There's no stochastics operating in this picture right now. Okay. But to get to that, those values. Oh yeah, these values came from a history yeah. that involves stochastic evolution. These things here, the, the blue at the bottom of each particle, those have been evolving according to a random walk, or you know, their, their transformations have been evolving, their log transform. So in the past, this has been affected by stochastics. Yeah. yeah? And the stochastic that we introduced were affecting those blue values, right? Yeah. That we, we introduced that stochastic directly that, by tooling. That, they'll affect those. these blue, that's right. Okay. They'll affect, in a Talian's model, some of these guys will be directly affected by stochastics because the, the uh, flow values are themselves stochastic. Mm -hmm. And so in, in Xiao Yan's model, these will be evolving directly to the stochastics. And, and, and these will be indirectly, the top ones in each particle will be indirectly affected here because, well, yeah, because C, which is the first of these blue guys, is evolving stochastically. And so that's going to lead to the flows up here over time to have some stochastic, to have a you know, to be, to be affected uh, by this stochastic parameter, which is going to lead to different numbers of people getting infected, even if the top values were the same, um, you know, but if the bottom values are different. So, so yeah, these have evolved stochastically by some stochastics. Mm -hmm. So, stochastic system. So, for a given particle, this is why these things are shown lined up with the particles, you can compute this expected case count, expected number of searches. It's just mechanically plugging in for the formulas involved and using the values in the, uh, that are parameter speci uh, particle specific plus, uh, you know, and those, those uh, any parameters for the model as a whole, they don't change. Okay, now, there is a empirical observations for the day. These don't depend on any par per particle things. These are like the, the data from the real world that we have. So maybe for this day, for time t, for day t, right? There are 10 clinical cases and uh, 15 searches, right? I'm going to say day t, um, just to make this. I really tried to sweat this last night. Um, so, so for this day, there's 10 clinical cases, let's suppose, and 15 searches, right? This is first from the, the data we're given. We don't get to choose these things. It's given to us, right? Oh, we look up on this day, oh, there's 10 clinical cases, 15 searches. So then what we're going to do for each particle, remember, each particle is going to have its weight updated by multiplying that weight by the likelihood, right? That's what we do at the observation step, right? That's how we, we reward particles that are more consistent with the data and punish particles that are less consistent. We multiply their existing weight by the likelihood that that they would observe, that their state, given their state, that they would observe the empirical data. So here are empirical data. So we'll compute two likelihoods here, okay? One likelihood would be for the clinical cases. And these likelihoods could be more than one if they're density. Because you can have a probability density whose values, a probability, you know, a probability mass function, has to, everything has to be less than or equal to one. But a probability density can be so consecrated in certain regions, it goes above one. The whole integral of this has to equal one, right? The integral across it has to equal one. But you can have a, if, if you're judging a continuous quantity, you can have a density that's more than one. So, so we, could, we could ask, okay, what is the probability density of observing clinical cases, et cetera, if, if it were continuous um, quantity. Okay, anyway. So the basic idea is you compute two likelihoods. Given these expected numbers and these observed numbers, you plug it in to your likelihood function, which is you plug it into these, these guys here. And to compute the, the composite likelihood, um, the likelihood of observing this many clinical cases and that many searches, you just multiply the two, okay? So that's what this guy is here. So we have likelihoods here, and um, and actually, what, what's troubling me is that this is a probability mass function for this, so this actually will be less than one. So I I um, 
I've been a bad boy. Um, so uh, that, that bothers me. So I'm just going to engage in some, um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> forgive me. Um, uh, there we go. Um, happy, happy. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, here uh, we have the likelihood that this particle, based on the expected number of searches and case counts, would, um, so it's so based on the expected case count, what's the likelihood we'd observe that clinical case count, and we put in that probability, okay? And we do that for every particle separately. Why separately? Because every particle is a different expected case count. And so we ask, what's the probability that it will observe that, okay? And this guy should obviously be less than 0.22, but you know, get my drift. Um, and so that these things are just computed by the first likelihood function, okay? These guys are computed by this likelihood function right here. We call off and we compute the likelihood. If we expect this many and we get this many, what's the probability we'll, we'll observe it? If it were continuous, it could be greater than one. Here, it's a probability mass function. So it's okay. Similarly, this guy here, these values, 0 0.75, 0 0.15, 0 0.03, those are computed. We have the model expects a certain number of searches. There are actually a certain number of searches, and we compute the likelihood of each of those through this likelihood function. Does that make sense? Okay. To get the composite likelihood, all we do is we multiply these two. Hmm? That, that's what this I said on the previous slide. The, the composite likelihood, the multivariate likelihood, if we have a likelihood of observing this many clinical cases, and so we have a likelihood of observing that many searches, we just multiply the two to get the likelihood we see this many cases and that many searches. Hmm? So that's all we do with this likelihood. And that composite likelihood then updates the weights. So this weight should be 0.033 now. Hey, oh man, um, should be 033 there. So uh, there we go, 033, because it's just, where did this 033 come from? Anyone tell me? One of my students, perhaps? Where did this come from? This updated weight, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. the, this composite likelihood, that's just, you know, the likelihood multiplied by each other, which results in that times what? times their original weight, right? This was their original weight, we observed this. So this original weight kind of summarized how good they accounted for things in the past. Actually, when, when you resample, it gets reset to one, but the very fact that it survived is an indication that it was pretty responsive before that, probably. But basically this point two is something to do with how well it matched in the, some recent points, probably. We multiply it by the composite like here, we get its updated weight and actually to be consistent with my, um, with my nice drawing here, I, I will pull this up, okay? We get, that gives us our updated weight. Same thing occurs for each particle, right? And then we might have a resampling step. Um, oh, and by the way, we have, to, we, we have to normalize these weights, so these will have to be normalized so they sum to one. That's it, yeah? So that's the um, analogy to the Bayesian analysis, right? Are you updating weights with like, with correct. Even um, yeah, I'll, I, I will point you to the slides which lay out completely the Bayesian, uh, the Bayesian perspective on this, which is laid out in the later parts of this slide, okay? Um, given the time, I don't think I'll go through it in detail, but I'll be happy to do so. And if you were interested over the next few weeks, I could give you a custom lecture um, on this, okay? Um, okay, which, by the way, would be required here in the students. Um, <laughs> okay. So I want to show you the results from this. The results are very thought about. Do, but do people have an, have an understanding of basically the layout of this model? Do you have an understanding of what we're doing here? About how these pieces fit together? We started with that model. We had a set, right? We, we started with the model uh, back way back when. Um, we started with the model. We have some dynamic parameters. We put them into the state variable. We have a set of data um, of two types for each of two jurisdictions. 
So we have a pair of data sets for each of two jurisdictions. In order to make sense of that data in light of the model's expect or the particle's expectations, we needed to formulate likelihood functions. We ended up in a negative binomial likelihood, which is of this form. We need to pick dispersion parameters that will dictate how generous or how accommodating we are for, for data that's off from what we expect in terms of punishing a particle or rewarding a particle. Um, how bad is it if a particle's off by, say, a thousand? Um, and as we run the model, each particle will have a compute, complete view of the world in terms of the state factor we talked about earlier. That complete view of the world will induce an expectation of how many people for that particle it thinks should be getting infected or should be presenting. Well, yes, it will induce how many people it thinks should be getting infected. And of those, based on this dynamic parameter F sub P, it induces how many people it thinks should be presenting for care, most likely. And, um, and similarly with number of searches. That's on a particle by particle basis. Particles which posit extremely low probability of searching, um, for example, this one here, 0.05, it's going to expect fewer searches. Similarly, particles that posit a very low C or, or a, very, a very low C may expect very few number of new cases. Okay, so this is 0.01. So the model, the, the particle state vector will dictate the number of expected searches or, or reported cases report, that, that are captured. We then judge each particle in terms of its expectation. How likely is that, given that expectation, that it would observe this number of clinical cases? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then that takes into account our likelihood function. So we have two likelihoods here, one for in clinical cases, one for searches. For each, we compute the likelihood that that particle will observe the empirical datum corresponding to it. Um, this clinical cases or for searches, and then we multiply those to get a composite likelihood, and then we update the weights by multiplying the original weights by that, and then we normalize the weights. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? And then that's the update step. And then then you can say, oh my gosh, and then we have this is just the uh, this is just a update for the observation. What do we do to get to the next observation? What horrendous things? Well, it's very simple. You just simulate each of these particles separately. You just run the model on those particles. They just evolve according to normal model equations, which per Lavi's comments are stochastic, right? So these particles go on and evolve. And sometimes you'll undertake a resampling process here. Sometimes they'll undertake a resampling if the effective sample size is too small and there'll be a survival of the fittest and those with low weights will tend to have very little chance of surviving and those with higher weights will tend to multiply. Hmm? Does that make sense? Is there a cut point or anything that's you sort of say? Yes. Yeah. You mean at which you do resampling? Yeah. yeah. If it goes below uh, uh, an effective sample size that's a certain fraction. Yeah. The, so, so uh, the effective sample size divided by the total sample size can be used uh, to compute a metric, which, and if it goes below a certain threshold, I think we've used 0.75 or 0.25, and try to, try to remember which one it was, but if it goes below that, we trigger resampling, okay? And the point is resampling, the survival of the fittest is really not, to, it's not purely dependent on resampling. It's just more obvious with resampling survival of the fittest because the particle died off. But absent that, particles with low weights are little representative anyway. You know, that, like when you draw from the particles, you're unlikely to get one. So there's kind of an implied survival of fittest even for a low weight particle, because they're little represented according to the theory of importance. Okay? Um, okay. Um, okay, so let's, here are the model results. Um, and I'm keenly aware I'm between you and lunch, so I won't draw this out long. Um, this model was not terribly impressive. We, we could probably could have tuned this to get a lot better results. This was done long, quite some long time ago now, and, and I think we could do a lot better for prediction. But it had a very thought-provoking lesson associated with it. That's the main takeaway. OK, so I want you to read these um, diagrams that are going to be coming up. These are from the paper. And um, 
you read them that uh, you know prior to the left of the dotted line we've been doing particle filtering to the right of the dotted line is forecasting. We just run that after we've we've honed the particles understanding we have a population of particles with certain weights we just run them forward from there and we can sample at any one time with the population particles. There's no particle filtering going on after the dotted line here. We're just running it forward. It's what uh, Yanni showed yesterday with uh, you know, following a certain point, you can predict outbreaks even though there's no particle filtering going on. We're just, with these data points here, um, if, if we should really color them black so that you can see you're just, they're just there to, com to compare to, okay? And we're gonna be showing you two types of information here. The left one is going to be for clinical cases, that's blue, I think blue scrubs. And the right cases are, are searches, okay? So these are search data over time for one jurisdiction. This is clinical case data for that same jurisdiction. Yes, Alex. One thing I noticed is that when you when you do the particle filtering, it kind of seems to overestimate a little bit. Yeah. But then afterwards, when you're forecasting, it un always seems to underestimate. There are cases. Um, I mean. I don't know if that's the case in in all models here. There were some issues with that that I think is is, is that uh, just because you po didn't quite possibly the case. It? Sorry, is that just because you didn't tune it like you said? You uh, yeah, I think I I think this model needs some TLC um, these days. But um, uh, but yeah, I mean I think it could have been improved materially, and, and I'm not sure why that is. It strikes me as something that's quite ad readily addressable, but it doesn't take away from the big point here. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to show you this with three different likelihood functions now. Oh, sorry, three. Uh -huh. Only considering clinical data. We're gonna be judging how well can the model anticipate what's gonna go on with clinical data if we stop it fairly early on in the, the evolution. But we're also going to be judging for that model, even though we're only considering clinical data for the particle filtering. And we're not considering any search data. We'll see how well it can predict searching data. Because after all, the model has a prediction of searching data in it. It's a dynamic model that involves people fearing and so on, and they're searching implied by that. There's some number, amount of expected. It's just not being corrected for it. It's not being banged if it's off. But it has some expectations, right? So we're gonna do this successively for a likelihood function associated with clinical data, a likelihood function associated with, that's, so only, can, only informing the model basically with clinical information and using that in its likelihood. Separately, a scenario where we're only informing it with, with search data. And finally, one we're informing it with both, okay? And for each one, we're going to see how well does it predict clinical data, how well does it predict clinical evolution, and how well does it predict search evolution. Even though, if we're only considering like clinical data in the particle filtering, we won't be using that to inform the model, we can see how well does it match in expectations. Is that okay? Okay, here we go. Only clinical likelihood. So we're, we're doing pretty well as long as we have clinical likelihood data. Well, the posterior is pretty good. After this point, <laughs> not so good. Not so good. It, it, so, so if you look at your monitor, <laughs> I think Xiaoyan knows this trick. Sometimes you can look like at an angle and you can see it's blue. But basically it becomes so diffuse, it doesn't know what to expect till sometime out of here. It very quickly says, I don't know how many cases there's going to be. Um, we're, we're, we're able, these are the posterior, so, so after we take into account an observation and it says, oh, oh, okay, that's where I am. It's like you're peaking, right? Every 30 seconds you're peaking and now you know where you are, but after you stop peaking and you're walking, you're in a bad way. You, you don't know where in the world you are. This is for search data. Notice it wasn't informed by search data. It wasn't told about search data in, in particle filtering. But it's able to kind of get, you can't really see it probably from where you are, but it's kind of a, a, a green here, but it's pretty diffuse even for here. And for here it's quite hopeless until the end, where it knows, it knows 
um, you know, the sun goes up, the sun is going to come down, and it's going to it's going to be coming down at some point. Okay. Okay, this is clinical uh, likelihood data for Manitoba. So that was Quebec. This is Manitoba. Goes up and <laughs> it's clueless. It's clueless. We need Shawnee and working on this model. I bet she could, within a couple of days, she could put it into shape, um, do it, make it better for this period. But this was an early model, and it wasn't very good. Okay, as long as you feed it data, it knows pretty well what the situation is. But when you try to look forward, it, it's not very effective. And this is this is Manitoba again, only clinical likelihood data, and it's really off as far as social, as far as the search data. Okay, now let's look only search data. Take a look at this. It thinks, whoa, you know, the number of cases of illness is taking off. It's able to anticipate how things go, not horribly with search data here, but in order to do so, it's unhinged as far as um, clinical data. It, it just can't make this transition to figure out how many clinical cases there are. All it knows is that you know eventually we'll be okay. That we'll, we'll have fewer cases. But in between, it's, it's very diffuse. It's all over the map. That's why you can't see any blue clearly up here. Amongst other things, it's probably quite high, and it's just all over the map. But this one, well, it, it ain't great, but um, it, it gets some, even though it's just predicting this, it gets some, um, it's, it's not horrible, not horrible. OK, this is only search likely data for a Quebec. So that last one, for some reason, they're in opposite orders. They should be in same order as the original. This is Quebec. And, and once again, you see it hopeless. If it's only inferred by search data, it can predict search data not horribly, but it can't predict clinical data worth beans. It thinks, whoa, it's taking off. You know, woe is me. Bad things are happening. The sky is falling. And, 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 and then it's not even very good at the end. This is blue here. You can't really see it, but it's predominantly blue up there. OK, this is the two likelihood functions. OK, now, there's a lot going on in this slide, so, so I, I, I need to spend a little bit more time on this one, even though we are overdue for lunch. Um, OK, first of all, two likelihood functions, what does that mean? We're taking into account in particle filtering until the red line, we're taking into account the clinical data and, and performing the particle filtering. Particles are judged and held to account in terms of how well they match the, the clinical data. But we're also holding them to, a, uh, to account in terms of how well they match the search data, right? And what you see here is, although it's not perfect, it's an incomparably better capacity to match the clinical data. I mean, it, it, compared to this on the left, or even compared to this, it's just like night and day, right? It's, it's, pretty, it's, it's pretty good. It, it certainly captures the overall features here. And you can say it's underestimating this, and I wouldn't disagree. But it's, um, it's pretty good in terms of getting this, even though it's only got data to time 30. It's projecting for it. Not bad. Not horrible. Not, not horrible, certainly. Take a look at the, the, um, uh, the data here for search, search OK? The data for search is pretty interesting as well. Um, here, it's able to capture it. You know, posterior is no big surprise. Here, it undershoots it, but it's getting the overall sort of uh, flow pretty decently in terms of how it comes down and, and, and goes down. But it underestimates the speed with which it, I'm oh, sorry, overestimates the speed with which it decreases. But I, what I want to draw your attention to to the fact is, is this. So I want to take this, this for Manitoba, and I want to compare this, remember what it looks like, with the case that we only had clinical data for Manitoba as well. So here's with both, here's with clinical data. Compare particularly this, the clinical expectation. Which would you say is better? This? Or, so the first one, this one here, or this one, in terms of how well it matches. I'd say this one, for 
pretty clearly in terms of it capturing the broad, in broad terms, it's not too far off. The other one is just all over the map. The only difference between these two, of course, is that we took into account search data. Come again? The only difference between this, what led to this result for clinical data, this improvement in clinical expectations, versus this, is that we've informed the model with search data. Here we had all the same clinical data, but it couldn't predict clinical cases worth beans after this time. But here we had same clinical data. The only difference is we informed the model with search data. And now we could anticipate clinical cases quite a lot better, much more, much more focused. And you could quibble again that it's, it's a bit off, but it's a lot better than just being all over the map, right? So what this is saying is that, yes, clinical data is probably higher quality data. But adding search data, this really low quality, highly ambiguous, weirdly incomplete, um, noisy data source actually improves our ability to, to predict clinical data. We can know where the outbreak is going much better with, with, um, with search data. Uh, we can know where it's going much better in terms of clinical cases using search data. Not surprising, we can also know where it's going better um, for searches, uh, much better if we consider search data than if we only consider uh, clinical, uh, clinical data. Here we don't have no clue where it's going to go search-wise. Um, here we, oh, excuse me, here we have um, a much better understanding because we've added search data. No big surprises there. Particle filter with search data lets it predict better search data. Oh, great. But it also, informing it with search data allows it to predict better clinical data is not at all obvious. Because you might think clinical data is so much better data quality, you're contaminating it with search data. Just let the search data, just let the clinical data search for, uh, uh, speak for itself and uh, you can be excused for thinking that's the best strategy for a good model output. No, adding in, adding in another data source, even though it's lower quality, can improve your ability to predict this high quality data source. And why? That may seem bizarrely counterintuitive because this is different information about the underlying situation that informs your understanding of the underlying situation. It's lower quality data, but it is data that adds information and adds to your ability to predict. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of cases like this in machine learning. And this is just one mm -hmm. example of it. And you can show statistically, if you have a higher variance data source and a lower variance data source, you don't throw out the low variance, the high variance data source. You combine them in a weighted way. And that's a bit reflective of what's going on. Same story, by the way, with Quebec. This is not a you know, one hit wonder sort of thing. Same thing with Quebec. Consider Quebec with two likely functions, and, and look, okay, yeah, it's, it's not great for clinical cases, but it, it again captures the overall sweep down, and it was a bit of tuning by Cheyenne, I think would be in good shape. Um, uh, you know, search data, it's, it's not too bad. Compare this with the case just of clinical data. So here we're predicting clinical data using search data together with clinical data. Let's compare how this compares with what our expectations are using just clinical data, no search data. So here we go, two likelihood functions for, so this was uh, Quebec, right? Two likelihood functions for uh, Quebec versus one. This is only clinical data. It has no clue how clinical data is gonna progress. What allows it to predict clinical data is search data at being added. That's the ticket to have both together. Then it can predict. Search data by itself, of course. Search data by itself for Quebec, hopeless to predict clinical. Both, there is the rub. That's the ticket. Nonlinearly better allows product, uh, capturing both. Here are some statistics. Yes, yeah, huh? Wouldn't it be more fair to compare the two models when the ground truths models are different as well? If you've got the ground truths including both data sources. Yeah, right. I, I see what you're saying. 
Um, so in other words, suppose we compare, very, very savvy question. Suppose we compare the ability to anticipate the future evolution of clinical cases using only clinical data and a model like an SEIR model, which is just for clinical cases, rather than asking it to match, to particle filter a bigger model with no data about the other pieces. Fair enough, I, I, I think that's a, uh, that's a good critique. Um, uh, fair, fair critique. Uh, and what the results would be, I'm not sure. Um, I suspect it might still be better with the search data, but you might argue it's a fair comparison or you know, less, uh, uh, less contrived comparison. So, so I like that. Okay, so this is, uh, for those who are interesting, we just compared these for one point in time, right? Time 30 visually. You can see the same thing holds dramatically for different periods of time. So T star is the time at which we stop considering data and start just projecting forward. Time 25, time 30, time 35, time 40, 40, 50. And here's for Manitoba versus Quebec in the bottom. Um, Manitoba, using just the search likelihood, um, these are for only reported cases. This is for, we're judging it only by clinical data. We're not dinging it if it's off from search data. We're judging how well can it predict clinical data. Using just search data, uh, it's horrible. Clinical likelihood better, uh, uh, data is better, and often, you know, this is, this is many times better for each of these, right? Um, well, for, for these guys here, um, then it starts to be less dramatic. Um, two likelihoods together, dramatically better, less discrepancy. It can do vastly better than either of these by orders of magnitude. Um, uh, Quebec, same basic pattern, although the, the details are different. And interestingly, it had a lot harder chance with Quebec in terms of prediction with two likelihoods. I'm not sure why, but it's still orders of magnitude better. Orders of magnitude better. So in short, for this model, and I, and I like Simon's point here, for this model to predict clinical cases better, even if you have a higher quality data set, clinical data set, you might want to add in sources of data that you might think are more noisy um, for particle filtering because it may enhance your ability to predict that clinical data in the future very materially. Counterintuitive for me, yes. It would be very interesting to see if it holds, I agree, for, for Simon's suggestion with a simpler SAIR model. But food for thought, and a pointer towards a feature that's been known in bioinformatics area for decades in terms of um, we don't want to shortchange data sources saying they're lower quality and throw them out, just toss them out uh, preemptively. Um, uh, we do ourselves a disservice if we just use quality to sort of cut away things and ignore them if they don't match a quality threshold. With the right tools that can make, that can be robust under variations in quality, we can actually turn lead into gold, ladies and gentlemen. Search data that's highly noisy, underinterpreted, et cetera, can actually add very materially to our ability to predict things that really matter, like clinical cases. Okay, so that's a, a, a thought-provoking case for particle filtering that where the actual model is not all that impressive. It needs some TLC more. But but does the take home lesson there I think is 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 quite strong one um, uh, to learn from. And I hope it's been useful to walk you through some of the detailed mechanics and choices involved in particle filtering. Like why Shaw Young said we're using a negative binomial function, what that means, why we can't just use a simpler binomial and, and how the how those multiple likelihoods are handled, et cetera, okay? Um, so let's go to lunch now, and uh, we will reconvene after that. And I think we'll be hearing one more, one more case study for a combined case, a model that includes two different conditions. This model considered two different data sources. And that model will as well consider two different data sources, but it will consider two different health conditions. 
that don't interact particularly much with each other biologically. It's not like one gives immunity to the other, but which rather share a certain features of the situation that drive them. And where understanding particle filtering, for one, can lend understanding of that underlying data, data underlying processes that drive both in a way that it can enhance prediction for the other. Okay? So this will be Xiao Yan's uh, final presentation. Thank you very much. It got lost. Oh. Really acquainted with any longer, I suppose. Oh. Um, you recording that? Um, when do you want to do that? Um, or did it? Um, so the meeting was I, I thought it was. Well, so, pardon me for just a second. Awesome. <laughs>